All right. Good morning, everybody. Can you wave if you can hear me? All right. Great. All right. Um, well, I'm going to say it again. Happy Mother's Day um, to all, all of our mothers out there. Um, I know traditionally at church we have a have a, a beautiful tradition of having flowers in front of of every uh, of the sanctuary, and um, all the children and friends and family coming forward and getting flowers for their mom. And obviously we can't do that today, but I'm just going to do virtual flower here. Um, have um, bouquet of flowers here, and I just want to say from my heart today to all you moms. Um, I love you. We love you. Um, I'm offering you a flower and I um, wish I could give it to you in person, but um, I would just want to thank you for um, the love you've sown into your children, um, the sacrifices that you make, and um, also for you spiritual mothers out there that don't have physical children, but have spiritually mothered many children. I also want to honor you. So um, I love you. And um, I'm thankful for you. We are thankful for you. Um, this morning, um, I'm so happy to be able to come and share uh, just a message with you this morning. Um, and it, it, it relates to Mother's Day. And it's also just uh, something I just want to share from my mother's heart for you as a church. In March of 1996, uh, 24 years ago, after carrying a baby around in my body for nine months, laboring for 10 hours, and then pushing a whopping 10-pound baby girl into the world, I instantly became a mom. I would like to say it was instantly glorious, but I had some recovering to do. Um, needless to say, I had stretch marks. Uh, I don't think that humans were created to carry a 10-pound baby in their body. Um, I had a burst blood vessel in my eye. And without sharing too much detail, um, I had a hard time sitting down for a few weeks. So it took a while for my body to go back to normal again, and I don't know if it's ever returned. Um, but um, I became a mother. And not to mention, with all of that, with my own body, um, I suddenly had a newborn that I had to take care of every minute of the day and had no clue what I was doing. Most of you moms out there can relate Bringing a child into the world is a lot of work, but most of us don't remember that part very well. In fact, Sean says, I have baby amnesia, and that's why we have five kids, because I don't remember the pain of childbirth and the, the chaos that ensues. Um, and there's a reason for that. Uh, the reason we don't remember is that the reward of motherhood is actually far surpassing the cost of motherhood. And another way to put it is the cost of motherhood is worth it. Uh, as I said, I went on and forgot how painful it was and crazy it was and ended up having five kids. But 22 years ago, I had another child. And this wasn't a physical child. This is a spiritual child. Um, the name of that child was Community of Faith Christian Fellowship, now known as Antioch Brighton. And when I look at Antioch Brighton, I just say, wow, thank you, Lord, for this child. What a blessing to see my children loving you. <clears throat> and then 10 years ago, in September of 2010, Sean and I had another child, the River Church. That is you, Antioch Waltham. And you know what I'm saying to myself through tears of joy as I'm saying, wow. Thank you, Lord, for a body and for a, a group of people, Lord, for these children who love you with their whole hearts and who love each other and who love this world so well. And I think, what more could a mother want for her children? You know, we mothers, we, we want a lot for our children. And um, as I was thinking and just meditating about Sean and I leaving for a year, um, I was thinking, um, what, what do I want for this body um, as I leave? And what would I want them to know from my heart? And um, I'm going to share that with you right now. Um, and I thought, you know, when I leave my house, my, my physical house here with my physical children, I actually say some things to them. And um, 
I, I think, you know, these are the things I want you to know while I'm gone. Don't forget these things. And I'll say things like, take care of your brothers and sisters. Don't hit anybody, you know, um, just be nice to each other. The, the things that, you know, you want so nobody kills each other. But there's also some things that I, as they leave the house, that I want them to know. Um, just remember who you are. You are the light of the world. So there's three things that I want to leave with you, Antioch Waltham, today. Um, Sean and I go away and plan to be back here in a year. But from my heart, I just want to say to you, first thing is take care of each other. In John 13, 34 and 40, 35, it says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And this passage is taken um, from in John 13, 13. And um, it's actually one of the most beautiful scenes of the Bible where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. And you know, um, washing feet was actually the job of the lowest servants and Jesus was just making a statement here of like, hey, if you love someone, you serve them. And, and, and that's what Jesus has asked us to do. He took off his uh, respected position. He laid it aside to love people where they needed to be loved and to take care of people in the most vulnerable of places. So I just want to encourage us today and remind us, even though we do such a good job already, but let us look for those dirty feet among us and let us be willing to take off our robes of distraction, excuses, pride, or whatever else might stand in our way. And let us love and serve one another wholeheartedly and with joy in our hearts. If you are in need, I encourage you to reach out to this body and, and let us in. What are your needs? Not just physical, emotional, mental, so many ways that we have need and and for every everyone else let us ask god to open our eyes to show us how can we love and serve our brothers and sisters in need you know the other day i was we were at dinner at the dinner table and i asked my son sam hey what are you learning and you know your online classes and he said well actually i learned something really interesting today he says did you know that the early church in ancient times um, really had an impact on culture. They even changed the statistics of the time of like life expectancy and quality of life. And I said, well, what do you mean? And, and so I just wanted to read you a little excerpt from an article that he was talking about. This is written by the Christian History Institute to tell us how early Christians shaped culture. In a world entirely lacking social services, Christians were their brother's keepers. At the end of the second century, Tertullian wrote that while pagan temples spent their donations on feasts and drinking bouts, Christians spent theirs to support and bury poor people, to supply the wants of boys and girls destitute of means and parents and of old persons confined to their homes. And another one, the willingness of Christians to care for others was put on dramatic public display when two great plagues swept the empire, one beginning in 165 and the second in 251 AD. Mortality rates climbed higher than 30%. Pagans tried to avoid all contact with the afflicted, often casting the still living into the gutters. Christians, on the other hand, nursed the sick, even though some believers died doing so. The results of these efforts were dramatic. We now know that elementary nursing, which is simply giving victims food and water, even without drugs, will reduce mortality in epidemics by as much as two-thirds. Consequently, Christians were more likely than pagans to recover a visible benefit. Wow, here we are in our own plague. Um, and there's there's so many things that Christians are doing and I, and I, and I want to um, just bring up a couple of examples in our own pandemic of some of the ways the body is helping each other. Um, I have a friend of mine who, who owns a restaurant, and she can't really do the same things and earn money the same way. So she's developed this new system of, of selling her produce. And um, another friend of mine has rallied people and said, hey, let's buy our produce from our friend and support her. And you know what? She's been able to pay every bill. 
And another friend of mine has a small business that really she can't do anything uh, much to earn money, but she's decided to sell cookie dough as a way to make money. And, and the church, again, is rallying around her to buy her cookie dough um, so that she can pay her bills. Church, I want to encourage you that this is your strength. Continue to love and serve each other heartedly and take care of each other. Um, another truth that I want my kids to remember, that I want you to remember when I leave, um, is to remember who you are. Um, when I was little, I was still in the days of listening to records, so I had a little record that I listened to a lot, it had a bunch of stories on it, and it had the story of the ugly duckling. I don't know if you remember that story, but basically, a little duckling struggles with himself because he looks so different from his siblings, and he considers himself ugly. He has, he has seen the swans, and he thought, oh, they're so beautiful, but I'm only a duckling. And even an ugly duckling at that. Even his, his duckling siblings make fun of him. But one day, um, after he had grown out of the duckling stage, he happens to see his reflection in the pond. And he, and he realizes, wait a minute, I look like the swan. And he realizes that he's a swan. And I just think, oh, how our Heavenly Father wants us to know whose family we are in. And how dearly he loves us. You know, as my own children have grown up, I've realized the importance of them having a family identity. Um, you know, we, we try to instill our, our kids thoughts like this. Like, you know, we are the Richmonds. This is what we do. We love each other. We love Jesus. We worship Jesus. We love our neighbors. We, we love our world. You know, other families, they may do these things, but this is what we do. Um, you know, where, where, where do we get identity? Where does identity come from? It comes from, it comes from the minutes. It comes from the hours. It comes from the days that turn into weeks, that turn into months, that turn into years of hearing the same message over and over again. And this is the message that God wants us to hear. You are mine. You are loved. You are in my family. You're my child. And I delight in you. You are significant and valued. You know, I have prayed for many of you over the years um, in many different situations. And I, and I have to say, um, a lot of times God will just drop a picture into my mind and, um, and I'll share it with you. And I have to say, a, a good proportion of the things that God shares with me in my mind is, a picture of an example of that would be a, a picture of, um, of, of a beautiful princess standing before her father, the king, and the king delighting over his princess. Um, another common thing that, that God brings to mind is um, a picture of a boy with his father playing together, maybe throwing rocks in the pond or throwing a baseball, but just the idea that, that God delights in his children. And, you know, um, God delights in you, church. Um, 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This is who we are, children of the King. Church, we have no true authority if we don't know who we are and that we are deeply loved. And I want to remind us today, as we continually look into that proverbial pond, that we would see the reflection that God has given us in his word, the Bible, and remind ourselves that we have come out of darkness into his glorious light. And speaking of light, the last thing that I want to leave you with is this. Let your light shine. I grew up singing the song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And you know, even now it's, it's used in a, in a um, secular context, but it's really, it's really meant about shining the light of Jesus. It's really the, the true context of that song. And, um, you know, as a child, that scene had been sown in me of the importance of allowing people to see the light of God in my life, even though it was imperfect. 
And I want to say it was my parents who demonstrated this, and I'm grateful for their example. And mom and dad, if you're on here right now, I just, I just want to say thank you. And my parents, they taught me the importance of intentionally loving our neighbors, checking on them, blessing them with gifts from time to time, being open with them about our hope in the Lord. Not, not only that, but my parents taught me the importance of looking out for the brokenhearted, the hungry, and the lonely ones among us. We picked up hitchhikers. Uh, we gave homeless people jobs working in our yard. We established real friendships with the outcast. Um, and also my parents, they taught me that my actions mattered and that how I lived my life affected those around me. And um, at my 10 year reunion, which has been a long time ago, um, I had a few, a few experiences that were impactful to me. One of them was um, a guy uh, shared with me how he had become a believer. And he said, you know, um, I remember you. I remember you were a Christian. And I, and I didn't always think it was cool, but, you know, I remember that about you. And, and I just want you to know that your life made a difference in my life. And um, at the same reunion, uh, somebody came up to Sean. He said, man, your wife, um, she, she loved me so well. And I remember her witness in high school. And honestly, guys, I hardly remembered this guy. But the witness was powerful. But you know, sometimes <clears throat> our witness can be hindered and our light can be hindered. Um, there is a scripture um, song in Philippians 2.12 that we will sing to our kids and our kids will probably roll their eyes as I'm saying this. And it, it goes like this. Do everything without complaining. Do everything without arguing. And it goes on. Um, it was our way to help them not to complain. And, but one day, um, God shed more light on, you know, what is that song really about? Is it just really about not complaining? You know, the don'ts of our Christian faith, which isn't usually that helpful. Um, but God was showing me, uh, why? Why do we want to do this? You know, another translation says, do everything without grumbling um, or arguing. And it goes on to say, so that you may become blameless and pure. And it goes on to say, that you may be children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And then this is my favorite part. Then you will shine like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. You will shine like stars. You will stand out like stars in a black sky in a warped and crooked generation. It is important how we live in this world. Will we be the ones who are known to be complainers, to bemoan the situation of our world? Or are we ones who will be destructive with our words? Or will we be ones who are filled with joy, accepting our lot, embracing the boundaries that God has drawn, rejoicing in the Lord, always giving thanks in all circumstances, encouraging those around us and gently and lovingly challenging the world to find their hope in the Lord. Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl, but instead they put it up on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In him was life, John 1, 4 and 5. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So church, I leave you with these three encouragements. Let us take care of each other. Let us remember who we are and let us light, let us let our light shine in the darkness. As I end, um, I just want to sing this little scripture over you. I think we're going to sing it again in a minute. But um, since singing is kind of my MO, I feel like uh, this is what I want to do to speak a blessing over you. So you can close your eyes or if you want to, whatever. <clears throat> the Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give
give you peace. Amen. Love you, church.